So today the main topic is going to be forecasters lemma. And so the, the focus of the next two lectures is going to be basically on, you know, the, my goal is to, by the end of it, give, give you a proof of uh, the strong duality theorem. And forecasters lemma is like, you know, one of the, the main ideas which uh, underpins uh, duality. So this is kind of one of the main reasons why it all works. Okay, so, <clears throat> all right, so the first thing, before we even talk about Farkas's lemma, um, one thing I want to show you is that, well, I want to mention is that, you know, if you have a linear program, you can transform it into some kind of special forms, okay? And one of those special forms is going to be kind of important for understanding, you know, the relevance of Farkas's lemma to linear programming. Okay, so the first special form we're going to look at this is going to be especially important tomorrow when we talk about duality. Um, so, so an LP, a linear program, is in canonical form if it can be written as, so if it can be written in the following form, so like usual we're going to say we're maximizing um, some linear function of the variables. So again, remember this is this is just a dot product. So this is uh, you know sum of your xi's, which are variables with coefficients, and subject to. Well, okay, this is kind of familiar, right? This is the kind of uh, constraints we were looking at before. But also you have another constraint. So subject to this constraint and the constraint that. That the x that all of your variables are non-negative. So so it's uh, so you have so it's just like before, right? Except you have an extra condition that I say all of the variables have to be non-negative. Now, okay. So the first kind of question is, okay, this this looks like it's a special type of linear program. But actually, as it turns out, you can if you have any linear program at all, you can always transform it into a linear program that has this type. Okay. So so basically, if you if you understood how to solve these types of linear programs, then you can always solve any linear program because you can first transform it into one that has this, this type, this structure. Okay, so that's a, a lemma. Okay. So actually in the exercises, all kind of, you know, there's an exercise which leads you through how to do this, um, but I'll just kind of, I'll give you a kind of hint. So, uh, so okay, so the lemma is any linear program, let's say it's a linear program with n variables, M constraints is equivalent to um, a linear program in canonical form. Okay, and this this one in canonical form, it's going to have uh, two n variables. So, so when you tra transform it to canonical form, the number of variables, but it's still you know, it's not it's not too much different than the original, um, and it has uh, it has the non-negativity constraints. Of course, just by definition of canonical form, you need to have these non-negativity constraints on all of your variables and uh, and m other constraints, which these m constraints these m kind of other constraints just come from the original constraints of your problem. So so I'm not going to because I, you know, I really want to get to the, the main kind of topic, which is the proof of Farkas's lemma, um, and also because this is this is kind of an easy exercise. Uh, I'm not going to give actually a, a proof, but I'll give a kind of a kind of hint at, the, at how you prove this. Uh, so basically, the idea is um, so so for each variable x i of the original. LP, we create two new variables. So we, so the the kind of the linear program that we're going to create, this canonical one. So every variable xi corresponds to two variables. So so we make variables xi plus and xi minus, and basically you substitute. Well, so well, basically express. <coughs> Xi as Xi plus minus Xi minus, where we can now 
make these things both non-negative. So of course, you know, any real number can be expressed as the difference of two different non-negative numbers. Um, and then basically what I, so when I say express xi this way, I mean everywhere in the original LP where you saw xi, you replace it with xi plus minus xi minus. Okay? And that'll give you a new linear program. The number of variables has doubled because every variable turned into two variables. Um, and you can have the, and all of the new variables have non-negativity constraints. Um, and you still have the same m constraints you had before. It's just you've put different variables in. Okay, this is, so this is sort of basically the proof. Uh, any questions about, about this? So sorry, this is a little bit fast. Oh, lots of stuff. Yeah. Right, yeah. It's sort of, so, I mean, one thing is, hmm. Um, well, you're going to have a, you're going to have a bigger matrix, right? So the, the number, it's going to be an m by 2n matrix, right? It's going to be kind of the same matrix you had before, except like every, uh, every col for every column, you're going to have a column next to it, which has the minus of that column, which, because that's going to kind of give you your, your xi, you know, plus and your xi minus. It's a bit, I think, I think if you do kind of go through it and try it in, in an example, um, you'll be able to work out how it goes. I mean, in any case, so when you, uh, so you can, so one thing you can do is you can take your original thing, you can write all the constraints down coming from the matrix. You can add in, you can change the, you know, you make the substitution and then kind of go backwards and, and turn it into a matrix again, right? That, that's always one possibility. So I kind of demonstrated how you can turn things into matrix form last time, right? You just take the coefficients, you put those in a matrix, yeah. So another, so this, uh, so like I said, canonical form is going to be really important next time because that's going to be, it's really closely linked to taking duals. Um, but today we're going to, so something that's going to be more important today for Farkas's lemma is uh, something called standard form. So, okay, so the definition is it's kind of the same as before. So an LP is in standard form if it looks like this. So maximize, you know, same thing as before, subject to, so now we have an equality constraint and a non-negativity constraint, okay? So it seems kind of weird, right? Every, so, uh, so what, I'm, what I claim next is that um, every linear, linear program is equivalent to one which is actually in standard form, right? So you can always have actually equality constraints here. So, in standard form. I'm just using this as a shorthand for standard. Um, and now, the number of variables in, when you trans transform to standard form is gonna be 2n plus m variables. And again, you're gonna have non-negativity constraints and kind of m other constraints. So here I just mean m constraints apart from these non-negativity constraints. And I'll say even less about the proof of this. So, well, so one thing is first use the previous lemma to put it into canonical form, right? So as a first step, you can, you're kind of halfway there, right? If you put it into canonical form, because this, this has an inequality, not an equality. And then the second thing, is you introduce one, what I'll call a slack variable for each constraint. But the, the kind of details of this are in the exercises, so, so C. And if you want to, so if you, if you try this out and you, you know, if you want to understand this better, perhaps, you know, one thing you can do is you can write in the form if you like. You know, if you if you're kind of a, if you're annoyed by the fact that I'm not giving you the full proof here, then I can write the full proof there, or we can we can discuss on the Moodle page. Okay, <clears throat> so now let's actually talk about Farkas's lemma. So Farkas's lemma, the point of it is to uh, understand. So you're given a linear program in, in standard form, and you want to know is there a feasible point or not, and you want to know if there's not a feasible point, then how can you sort of check for that, or, or, or what do you get instead of a feasible point? Okay, so, 
There's the statement. Right, so the statement's as follows. So, so let A be an M by N matrix, and let B be an M dimensional column vector. <clears throat> then exactly one of the following is true. So I'll give you two different scenarios, and, and one of them one of them has to always be true, and they can't both be true. So, so it's always exactly one or the other. Okay, so the first one, the first one is basically, um, so okay, if you had this A and B, you can write, well, you can write the constraints of a linear, of a standard form linear program, right? So uh, AX equals B, X is non-negative. And the first, the first thing that could be true is that there could be a feasible point for this linear program. So the first thing is that there exists an X, such that AX equals B and X is non-negative. Okay, so now the second thing says, basically, if this, is, if this is not true, then you're gonna find something else. So the something else is, there exists a Y. Oh, sure, I, sorry, maybe I should, I should just make this extra kind of clear. All right, so X is in R to the N. Right? It's a N-dimensional column vector. Otherwise, I mean, technically otherwise, this. Uh, this multiplication wouldn't make any sense, right? It has to be in Rn. The second possibility is that there exists a Y in Rm such that Y transpose A is non-negative and Y transpose B is, so this is, this is just a dot product of two, ve two vectors, right? It's just, uh, and this is negative. So I think it is kind of difficult to see to understand what is the point of this until tomorrow when we're going to use it to prove duality. But, uh, but basically the, the kind of message here is that, so Farkas's lemma gives a, so this gives a simple certificate. Probably this isn't very visible, is it, up here? There. Maybe I'll switch colors. So this gives a simple certificate uh, for showing that um, a linear program in standard form has no feasible point. So there's no feasible point for a linear program like this, right? In other words, what I mean is, so if, y, if such a Y exists, then X automatically doesn't exist. Okay. So if, if somebody gives you a linear program with this matrix A and this vector B, and I show you that there's some Y that satisfies this condition, that automatically tells you it's not feasible. Uh, was there a question? Okay, it's okay. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is now give you a proof of this lemma. Are there any questions? And of course, like, I mean, technically this is only talking about things which are in standard form, right? But like I said, you know, any linear program can be turned into standard form so then it actually applies to any linear program. Okay, so, so we wanna show that exactly one of these is always true. So that means that we wanna show that, first of all, they can't both be false, right? And then second, we wanna show they can't both be true at the same time, right? We wanna show these two things and then it'll imply that exactly one of them must always be true. So first, so the easy direction, so proof that a and B can't both hold. So suppose that they both, so suppose that X and Y both exist. So having these properties. So okay, using the fact that this, this particular X exists, we can simply write this equation down. So it is, so since X exists, you know, X has this property that AX is equal to B. And now what we can do is we can, so this is, a, this is an M-dimensional vector. Of course, this is also an M-dimensional vector because, well, they're equal. So what I can do is I can, I can multiply both sides of this equation by, on the, you have to be careful, you, you can only, only do this on the left side, right? But I can multiply on the left by Y, or Y transpose. 
left. But now, um, so matrix multiplication is associative. I mean, maybe you don't remember what associative means, but it basically means that if you have some kind of, you know, you're multiplying three different things and you have brackets somewhere, then you can move the brackets around. So, so I can move the brackets like this. So that's by associativity. Ah, but now we know something about Y transpose A, right? Y transpose A is a, it's a non-negative vector. That's all we know about it. So this thing here, so this is a non-negative vector. But we also know that X is a non-negative vector, right? Ah, so one thing, sorry, I, uh, this should have, I think this should have said, I should have had a transpose here, just to, just because I think this makes a row vector when I multiply them, but sorry. Okay, so this is a non-negative row vector. This is a non-negative column vector. When you, multi when you take their dot product, it's basically, you know, you take a bunch of non-negative numbers and you add them up. So on this, so this left side, the left-hand side is a, is a non-negative real number, right? This is just a real number and it's non-negative. The right side is a negative real number, right? Because, because that was property... Property B said that this is negative. So right-hand side is less than zero, and that's a contradiction. Is this how you write contradiction? Or maybe like this. Anyway, anyway it's, it's definitely a contradiction. You can't have a, a non-negative number equaling a negative number. Okay. So now we want to focus on um, proving that... Okay, so now it's, it's definitely true that A and B can't both hold. Now we want to show that they can't both be true at the same time. And this part, this is the harder part. So for this, we need to use something called the separating hyperplane theorem. And we also need to know what is convexity. So, uh, so a set C in, in Rn is said to be convex or convex if for all x and y in C, um, and all lambda between 0 and 1, we have that lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y is also in C. How many of you have seen this definition before? So quite a few, not necessarily everyone, but, but quite a few. So if you, yeah, so, so if, if anyone hasn't seen this definition before, then, I mean, the idea, I mean, so here I've written things kind of algebraically. It's maybe not clear what this really means, but, uh, and basically, the idea is that you know it's it's convex if whenever you take two points in C, so x and y, then so so x and y are in C, and the whole line segment which joins them is also in C. So if you choose him in C and you choose him in C, then the line segment between them in C. That's that's really just uh, so this this thing where you're taking lambda times x, one minus lambda times y, with lambda between zero and one. That's just giving you you know, kind of, so when lambda is equal to 1, you just get x. When lambda is equal to 0, you just get y. And when lambda is something between 0 and 1, you get something along this line, right? So, so as an example, you know, if you take a circle or if you take some sort of nice polygon, so these things are co convex because you can see if you take two points in here, then the line between them stays inside the set, you know. But these, this, these things are not convex, not convex. So something like this something like this, or something disconnected. So these are not convex because, for example, here if I take x and y to be these points, then the line segment between them goes outside the set. <clears throat> okay. Start here. Okay, so, <clears throat> so I'm not going to have time to prove this, but, uh, but I think it's, it's not that hard of a, of a result to, to believe. So, so what I'm going, so what this, this thing says is basically, I mean, so I'm going to write a formal statement in a second, but I mean, the basic idea is kind of simple. You know, if you take a, basically, if you take a convex set, you know, C, which is convex, and if you take some point which is outside of C, right, so take some point, uh, you know, Y outside of C, <clears throat> then because this thing is convex, then there must always exist a, uh, I mean, okay, so here, here we're in two dimensions, so so in two dimensions, basically what this would say is that if you take a convex set and a, a point outside the set, then there exists a line, a straight line going through the whole space 
which separates the two. So y is on one side of the line, and the whole convex set is on the other side. And in, if you were in R3, this would say that you know, there's, a, there's a plane which cuts the space where y is on one side and, and this c is on the other. Okay, and this, obviously, this doesn't work if your set's not convex because so here there's no separating line, right? Because the line has to extend you know, to infinity in both directions. And you simply, no matter how you try to put a line here, you, know, you, can't, you can't put all of C on one side and, and Y on the other. That's important. Okay, but, but as long as C is convex, you can do it. Okay, so the, the technical statement is as follows. Any questions about anything so far? before I write this. Okay, so let C be a subset of Rn. So let it be a non-empty. Okay, it needs to be closed convex uh, set. Okay, the fact that it has to be closed is kind of, well, because is because otherwise Y could be right on the boundary of the set. So, oh, and let Y be a point which is outside C. So at, at first glance, this is not going to look like a, anything to do with hyperplanes. But uh, so, so then there exists a vector w in R, R to the n, and a real number alpha such that, first of all, a trans, sorry, uh, w transpose y is greater than alpha. And um, W transpose X is less than alpha for all X in C. So at the moment, this doesn't actually say anything about hyperplanes, right? It talks about, so you find this vector W in this, uh, this number alpha. Basically, the idea is that if you think about it, um, so OK, suppose we're in this picture. Suppose this is the origin, right? Then the vector W would be something which points like this. I tried to make this orthogonal with this with this line. It's probably not very orthogonal. But but the idea is that um, uh, you know the plane, the, the actual hyperplane that cuts these two, is one which is orthogonal with W, and is kind of distance in some sense alpha kind of shifted in this direction. So it's not a, it's not a line. It's not a plane going through the origin. It's kind of shifted, and this kind of tells you how far it's shifted. So yeah, apologies if that's not clear. But but you can think about it, um, and it turns out it's the same thing as finding a hyperplane. Let's see. Okay, so now I want to. Uh, any questions right at the moment? Yeah, I apologize. This is quite a technical, you know, lecture. I think most of the topics we're going to cover are going to be, you know, more fun than this, less technical. But but this stuff is is quite important. So uh, you know, it'd be a shame if you did a combinatorics optimization, combinatorial optimization module, and if you didn't know anything about you know Farkas's lemma and linear programming. Um, but at the same time. I'm doing this in one week, so I have to be a bit fast. Anyway, so what do we need to do now? So, so we're still trying to prove this lemma. I've already proven that these things can't hold at the same time, that the x and y can't both exist. Now we have to show that they can't, well, that at least one of them has to exist. So proof that one of a or b must hold. OK. OK. So. So take this matrix A and let, so define some vectors A1, A2, up to AN. So let these be the column vectors. Of A. What, what I mean is basically just this is the first column. This is the second column up to the nth column. You have, yeah. Remember, A is an M by N matrix, so these are all these are all in R to the M, just to keep things keep things straight. Okay, now I'm going to make a definition. So define a set C, which we're going to let. So C is defined to be basically. I mean, in some sense, we're we're going to take linear combinations of these vectors, but not all linear combinations. So only. So it's a set of all, all ways of taking you know, lambda i, a i, so summing up. You know, this is so far this is just a, a linear combination, but um, we're going to restrict these coefficients to all be positive. 
or sorry, not positive, but non-negative. So it's, if, if you haven't seen this sort of thing before, it's not, it's not clear what this, even, what this thing even does. So, I mean, as an example, just a kind of simple example, you know, suppose we're just, uh, suppose there's just two vectors, like maybe it's like this, A1 and A2 in R2. So, so what would the set C look like? Well, can anyone describe what the set C would look like? So you take, take positive combinations of these things. Maybe it's hard, I mean, I guess it's, it's hard to describe a picture anyway. Um, but basically, what you're going to get is like, oops, sorry. So the set C is going to be all of this stuff, right? So basically, I mean, so, so you're not taking all the linear combinations, so you're not going to get, it's not going to span the whole plane, but it's just going to, it's just going to take kind of this, this stuff. So this is called the uh, this is called the convex cone, I think. Yeah. You're not going to need to really know this for this module, but um, but it's useful to know. You know, in the literature, this is called the convex cone, generated by a1 to an, and you can sort of see why it's called a cone. I mean, if you okay, if you thought of this in three dimensions and you took three vectors, and you know, it's going to make a sort of not exactly a comb, but sort of like a pyramid type shape, which which goes off to infinity. And this is sort of like a it's sort of like a cone, isn't it? So so one thing I'm it's just a kind of so this is also another thing that's in the exercises, but so it's not it's not hard to prove, but it's something that I I mean it's also it's sort of not hard to see, but uh, so the set C is closed and Convex. So the convex part, this is really easy to prove. It's easy to see that if you take, you know, a convex combi combination of two vectors in this space, it's going to be, or in this set, it's it's going to remain in the set. So this is just if you go from the definition of of convex, this is pretty easy to prove. This is a this is a bit a bit harder, but it's again, it's not it's not terribly difficult. Okay, so, so this is closed and convex. So therefore, we can apply the separating hyperplane theorem to it. But first, we need to, to do a little bit more. So, so here's, a, here's a kind of easy fact. Um, so, so notice that B is not in C. Because if it was, so if it were, then we can write B in the form sum lam of lambda i a i, where these things are all non-negative. And if you think about it, what this does is that if, if we can now just define, so if you had this kind of sum, we can define the vector x to just be lambda 1. So it's, a, it's just this, this vector. And it turns out that you know, by, because of this formula, if you think if you think through, because of this, you get actually that ax is equal to b, and x is non-negative because all of these lambdas are non-negative. So literally, you know, this uh, this equation here, I'll call this star. So this is this happens, and this is exactly the same as star. So this is because. I mean, basically, if you just think of the definition of matrix multiplication, that's going to happen. Any questions about that before I send it off to the talk? Yeah. Okay. I'll put some notes online this evening, which hopefully, you know, if you go through them slower than I'm going through this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I see. Yeah. So I, I said this briefly yesterday, but it's possible that not, not everyone heard it. So, so this, in this notation that I'm using, this means that ui is at least vi for all i. And this only applies when u and v are in the same dimension. So whenever I write this, it means actually it completely dominates the other vector. OK, so I've got maybe two minutes. So I'm just going to quickly just finish up. We're at the end of this proof. Um, okay, so b doesn't, uh, so b is not in c. So we're, we're in really good shape, right? c is a convex closed set. And B is outside of it, so we can apply the separating hyperplane theorem. So, so by the separating hy hyperplane theorem, there exists W, so W in R M, I believe. Yeah, 
and alpha in R such that W transpose B is bigger than alpha and W transpose X is less than alpha for all X and C. Right? This is just literally applying the theorem. Um, notice that so the zero vector is in C. Right? So that so if you kind of um, so if you apply this with x equal to the zero vector, you'll get zero on the left side, and so alpha better be non-negative. Right? If this is a negative number, it wouldn't make any sense because you'd have zero less than a negative number. So that implies alpha's alpha has to be non-negative. Um, so in particular, yeah. Uh, so also I claim that we can't have. any x and c with uh, w transpose x greater than 0. Because otherwise, so take lambda, a large number, and note that lambda x is also in c. And so if you take lambda big enough, you'll get, so you can just put the lambda here, you know, it, it'll just scale this up and eventually it'll become larger than alpha. So, for lambda large, you get, um, and that would be a contradiction. So therefore you must have that actually So therefore, this occurs. Now the last step is, so this is for all x and c. So y is going to be negative w. And if you check, so then, um, ah, yes. One last thing to notice is that, so I claim that now b holds for this choice of y. So certainly, certainly we're happy here because y times, so w transpose times b is positive. So if I make this negative, it'll, it'll be the negative. And the last thing is that, so, sorry, I'm, I should wrap up. Uh, and, and this finishes the proof. Okay. So